This video is going to focus on equity valuation and we're going to go through the free cash flow to equity model. Now with this video the template that I'm using has an example that we're going to walk through. If you want to print off the entire template or just the example you can find the template available on Google Docs and here's a quick easy link to get there. Now typically in introductory to finance classes when the idea of stock valuation is introduced we start out with dividend discount models and the reason for that is discount dividend models are somewhat intuitive once you understand time value of money and you understand the idea of present value of cash flows if you look at a stock you receive dividends for holding stock and so you just forecast what those dividends are going to be discount them back to today at an appropriate risk adjusted rate of return and that tells you what the stock is worth. The problem with that is that there are several companies out there that do not pay dividends. For example, Apple right now is one of the most valuable companies in the world and as of the time I'm recording this video, it's currently July 2011, Apple is not paying dividends to its shareholders. Does that mean it's not worth anything? No, Apple's a very valuable company. The stock is trading right now for about $360 a share. It's an extremely profitable company, but instead of distributing dividends to their shareholders, they're instead reinvesting that money back into the company. So how do we go ahead and figure out what the value is for companies that don't pay dividends? And the free cash flow model also can be helpful for companies that do pay dividends but maybe they only pay out a small portion of their profits in the form of dividends because they're instead reinvesting a lot of that into the company. So specifically what we're going to use here is referred to as free cash flow to equity. FC free cash FE flow to equity. So free cash flow to equity model and the free cash flow for equity model starts out with net income. So how much money did the company make? However, depreciation or depreciation and amortization are non-cash expenses. They lowered our net income but we didn't pay anything for them. So we want to add that back in. However, then we want to take out capital expenditures. When we purchased property, plant, and equipment, that didn't directly lower our net income but it was a cash outflow. Now from an accounting perspective, depreciation is supposed to smooth out those capital expenditures, but from a finance perspective, we're more concerned about the timing. We want to capture when that money was spent, so we want to capture the capital expenditures and take back out the depreciation. You also are going to look at issues related to increasing in increases in non-cash working capital. That NC there stands for non-cash. And here we're talking about things like inventory, our accounts receivable, things like that. For example, let's say that at the start of the year my company has 100000 in accounts receivable. At the end of the year, I have 150000 in accounts receivable. Now, when I sold my product, that went into the net income. But this increase in accounts receivable indicates that I have an extra $50,000 of uncollected revenues yet. So they haven't become cash flows. So if I increase my accounts receivable, then my net income is actually overstated a little bit. I have to subtract that back out. So if I increase my non-cash working capital, I need to lower my free cash flow to equities to reflect that. We can think of the same line of thinking with inventory. If instead of accounts receivable, this was inventory, the same idea would work. As my inventory increases, that's not affecting my cost of goods sold yet, but it has affected my cash flows. So we have accounts receivable, inventory, accounts payable. Accounts payable works the opposite way. As accounts payable goes up, that actually lowers our, or as accounts payable goes up, that actually increases our cash flows because the accounts payable reflects stuff that we've accumulated, but we haven't paid for yet. So we want to adjust all those non-cash working capital accounts 
and adjust to net income. Finally, we want to look at debt. And there are two areas of debt we're going to look at here. New debt issued. If I as a company issue new debt, that's money available to shareholders. If I pay off debt, that's money that's got to be covered. Now, you might say, well, let's just issue a whole bunch of new debt, and that's a bunch of extra cash flow to equity. But as we do that, that debt eventually is going to have to be repaid. So it's going to show back up here as debt paid. Also, we're going to be paying interest on that, so the interest is going to lower our net income, and later on we're also going to have to pay off that debt. So it's not just as simple as, let's issue a whole bunch of new debt, and that's going to make the firm more valuable, because any new debt issued that raises our free cash flow to equity this period is going to be offset by less net income over the future years, and that debt repaid at maturity. Doesn't mean we shouldn't issue debt either, but it more is a matter of can we use that debt productively. Debt is not a free source of adding to our free cash flows to equity. So let's go through an example. And this is the example that you might want to print the template off for so you can always have it handy. If I was going to do this assignment in class, I would start out by setting up some forecasts. Our company has 500,000 shares of stock outstanding. We estimate that the stock has a beta of 1.3. Constant growth after year four of 5%. We're going to use a non-constant or super normal growth model. And then for each year, for the first four years, because our constant growth is after year four, so we have to forecast out each of the first four years, we start with our net income. Depreciation and the depreciation, you can pick that up off of the statement of cash flows. Capital expenditures, again, you can get that off of the statement of cash flows. Increases in non-cash working capital, again, that's going to be information provided on the statement of cash flows. And then any new debt issued are debt repaid. Again, statement of cash flows. This information is going to be found in cash flow from operating activities. This will also be part of cash flow from operating activities. So let's just put an O there for operating activities. The capital expenditures will be cash flow from investing activities. And the new debt and debt paid will be cash flows from financing activities. Now, unfortunately, what you're going to find in the statement of cash flows is those are past data. What we need to do is project forward. So in a real life scenario, it doesn't really matter what these were in the previous years. We can use that previous year's data to kind of get a baseline, but we've got to project what's going to happen going forward. So all of these are forecasts, not just past data. And then finally, we have the expected market return of 10% and the risk-free rate of 4%. The expected market return, risk-free rate, and beta are going to be used in order to get our required return that we're going to use to discount these cash flows at. But that's our starting point. That's our example. We've got all our forecasts set up. So now we want to start working through and figuring out what this company is worth. Step one, we want to forecast the free cash flows to equity. Now if we go back, remember our formula, we start with net income, add in depreciation. So our net income is $800,000. Let's add in depreciation. Depreciation is $200,000 in our example for year one. And then we need to take out capital expenditures. Those are 300000 in year one. Next, we need to subtract increases in working capital. Now note, this is a decrease in working capital. Our, our increase in work, net working capital, our non-cash working capital is negative. So that means we actually lowered those amount. So we're going to subtract negative 50000 
and then we want to add in our new debt reissued 150,000 in new debt lastly we paid off $100,000 in existing debt so we've got to subtract that as a cash flow now I went ahead and did those for the first four years you can see at the end of year one we've generated eight hundred thousand dollars in free cash flow that's available to our stockholders in year two eight hundred seventy five thousand year three eight hundred thirty thousand and finally in year four we have nine hundred fifteen thousand and again all the numbers came from this table I'd encourage you if you're watching this video go ahead and pause it here try to go through and get all those calculations on your own so make sure you can calculate the free cash flow to equity values for each year and that you're coming up with the same things we've got here now we forecasted the first four years and then we said after that we're just going to assume growth is constant at five percent a year this idea here is that if you're looking at a company you might have some predictability for the next couple years you can look at the economy you can look at what the company is working on how fast it's been growing in the last year or two look at their competitive environment you go through all those different types of issues in analyzing the company fundamental analysis and trying to get an understanding of what the company's competitive situation is what the economic environment is what the industry outlook is and try to make some of these forecasts and then once you've got those you know you get out year four year five after a certain point in time you're like I can't predict what's going to happen much further I mean if you're looking at a company like Apple you might be able to look at what they're working on and project the next few years but what's Apple going to be working on eight years from now or nine years from now Apple probably doesn't even know at this point so if they don't know how can you as an investor know what they're going to be working on what's the economic outlook going to be eight or nine years from now who knows so at this point we project out as far as we reasonably can and then assume some constant growth rate after that typically it's going to be low single digits growth rates that you're going to use in that constant growth area but that's our five percent so we forecast values for the first four years next we want to determine the required return now for the required return we're going to use the security market line there's some debate about how valid the security market line is but for the sake of argument let's just go ahead and use that as our required return the information that was provided in our example we had a risk-free rate of four percent I like to use the 10-year Treasury note to approximate the risk-free rate some people prefer the treasury bill rate however in my view equities are a long-term investment so a 10-year treasury note also matches the time horizon better than a treasury bill rate will expected return on the market is given at 10 percent and beta is given at 1.30 now your expected market return in practice you're going to have to kind of estimate what that is it should always be greater than the risk-free rate because you're not going to make an investment in stocks if you think that you're earning less than the risk-free rate and beta you can either calculate that on your own from looking at historical data or look it up in a source like Yahoo Finance or value line or any other number of sources that will provide an estimate for beta so once we have our data we plug it into the security market line risk-free rate plus beta times our risk premium the risk premium is just the expected return on the market minus the risk free rate go through the calculations and we get a required return of 11.8 percent next thing we need to do is figure out what all the free cash flows are worth after we've done predicting so we predicted the first four years but the company doesn't stop and liquidate itself after four years it keeps going however at that point we had a constant growth rate so we can use the constant growth formula we just take the free cash flow to equity in year five divide by the required return minus the growth rate and that's going to give us the value of the firm as of year four note you're using the free cash flow estimate one year 
after the value. Whenever you use this constant growth model, you always plug in the dividend or free cash flow one year prior or one year after the value you're trying to solve. So free cash flow to equity in year five is just the free cash flow and equity in year four that we forecasted earlier times one plus the growth rate. Now just a reminder, when we forecasted free cash flow to equity in year four, we got 915,000. So we plug that in. Our constant growth rate is 5%. So our forecasted free cash flow to equity in year five is $960,750. Our required return we calculated in step two, said that was 11.8%. Plug that in, 0.118. Our constant growth rate, 5%. Solve for value, and we get 14,128,676. Now, that's not the value today. That's the value in year four. We want to figure out what this company is worth now, so we're going to have to go and discount these cash flows back. If you've got a cash or a financial calculator, you'll go to your cash flow worksheet or your NPV function and plug in your free cash flows to equity. Reassume that your zero is our starting point. Our first free cash flow to equity, our first cash flow is year one. So we have 800,000 in year one, 875, 830. Again, these are just the values that we came up with when we were forecasting. Remember the 800 in year one, 875 in year two, 830 in year three. Now this is an area that sometimes gets a little confusing. Where did I get this 15,043,676? The answer for that comes from two places. One, our free cash flow to equity in year four was 915,000. Our value in year four was 14,128,000. Since those were both year four cash flows, we've got to add them together. And that's going to give us that 15,043,000. So these are both of our year four cash flows, the year four cash flow, free cash flow to equity, and the value of all the other cash flows to equity discounted back to year four. Our discount rate is 11.8%. Solve for net present value. We get the value of the firm or the value of the firm's equity at $11,638,683. Once we do that, the last step is just to convert it to a per share value. In our example, we said the number of shares outstanding is 500,000. So we just take the value of the firm's equity divided by the number of shares outstanding, and that gives us a value of $23.28. So that's all there is to calculating the value of the firm using the free cash flow to equity model. This model is very useful in a practical application because a lot of firms do not pay dividends and are pay only a small portion of their profits in dividends. And essentially how we're looking at it is we're looking at it from the perspective of somebody that's not just buying a share, but remember a large institutional investor could decide to buy the entire company. So if they buy the entire company, all the cash flows belong to them. So we're trying to value the company, not value really each share of stock. And when you value the company, you just divide by the number of shares, that's gonna give you the value per share. So the free cash flow to equity model, I think, is a more valuable model than the dividend discount model. It works for more firms. And I'll try to put together a video or two videos coming up in the future where we walk through a situation and try to apply this in a real world scenario. I'll pick a company, pull up some financial data for that company, and we'll try to go through the valuation process. Hope this video has been helpful. Thank you.